let's wait for uh, the last 15 minutes, but let me invite uh, at this time our second speaker, Dr. Emily Hunt. She's also the Dean of our engineering school. Thank you for having me today. That this timing is perfect for me to go after Dr. Boma explains all of the science behind the coronavirus and how it's um, actually structured and how it's spreading. And Dr. Boma and I have worked together on um, so many different parts of, of research over the last several years. And some of the things that I want to talk about today, um, she, we've worked together as a team on, on so many things. So I um, come from a mechanical engineering perspective and uh, instead of a biological perspective. So, so much of what I learned has been from working uh, with different microbiologists and with Dr. Boma um, specifically. So I'm, I'm honored to be here and get to present with you today. Okay. So I began working in nanomaterials in the early 2000s. For some of you, you were um, just born in the early 2000s, right? And that's when nanotechnology became, nanomaterial specifically became its own field. And what we realized is that when we take a, a material down to the nano scale, which is just one scale, like 10 times larger than an atom, when we go down to that scale, materials have all different properties. So they even are different colors. So when we talk, we think about um, silver, for instance, we're going to talk about silver some today. Silver is actually purple when you take it to a nanoscale. And you just, you have all of these different changes occur, but not, not just the colors, but how they perform from a mechanical perspective. So when I talk about strength or ductility or the different things you would think of with a structural material, when you go down to the nanoscale, all of that changes. And so we started, it was really opened up a new field of material science for engineers in the early 2000s when we started to look at these materials and look at how we could use them. Specifically, when we talk about energetic materials, which is, is where I started, it, it changes your mindset from thinking about using a fuel and an oxidizer for a fire, right, to produce gaseous products. We figured out that there's so much chemical energy stored in nanomaterials in nanoscale uh, materials themselves that we could actually have a reaction, which would normally you would think of as your fire or your explosion, but what we're left with is a new solid alloy. And this, this was an incredible thing for us at that time. In 2008, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency issued a call for proposals to develop materials that would combat weapons of mass destruction. At the time, I had been working in research on materials that would resist some types of microbial growth. And so we quickly transitioned to start looking at these specific microbes that would that act like anthrax, for example. Anthrax is kind of the most common one that we all connect with, but um, there are several different types of spore-forming bacteria that are harmful as well because they can go into a dormant state and they can resist extreme conditions. So they can resist explosions or freezing or all kinds of different things. Um, the Defense Threat Reduction, Reduction Agency works outside the borders of the U.S. to neutralize any kind of microbial or biological uh, warfare development outside our borders. So when you think about trying to neutralize a threat to the United States outside of it, um, you wouldn't just want to make it explode, right? Because if they're producing biological warfare, you would just be blowing that out everywhere. And so we were looking at how do we neutralize threats without endangering um, the areas and people and communities around where these different facilities were located. This was a very exciting work for us. As engineers, when we worked with nanomaterials, we started to realize that instead of taking a material that we already have and know about, we could build a material that we need. So we were really um, intrigued and challenged by the idea of how do we build a material from the atomic level up that functions against harmful microbes? How do we optimize the properties of nanoparticles to it, get an end result that's, that's functional and is, is ideal for, for our application? So what happened is we actually developed two types of materials for the Department of Defense. One was a gaseous material and one was a solid material. 
when the research contract was done, we turned the, the science, we turned our results back over to the government and they did, then utilized it and still utilize it in gas mass technology. At that time, we were able to commercialize the product. So what we saw is that, yes, in this specific instance, the government has a need for this product um, in a military aspect, but we could already see so many different commercial uses for a material that would protect against harmful microbes, uh, whether that be bacteria, which is what we've worked on most of the time, or viruses, which is what we talk about now. So as, as, enge as engineers, how, the way that we work, we learn in college a problem-solving methodology, and we, we apply it to almost everything in life. It actually kind of changes our brain where we can't even um, respond to normal situations without taking it through a quick problem-solving loop. But what we do, we have some kind of ideation or we see that there's a problem. Next, we take it and we use what we know to start to develop some product solutions, some problem solutions. Then we prototype, we test, we manufacture, and then we can actually deploy a solution into the market. So this was the first product that we actually, so we formed a company and this was our first product that we launched into the marketplace. It's interesting because I gave a presentation to a group of business owners a year ago. And as an antimicrobials company, that's what we do. Um, we were talking about antimicrobials in the marketplace. And it was the first time some of them had heard the, the terms microorganism or bacteria or virus since college, right? Nobody cared. And what's crazy is that one year later, my kindergartner knows what a fomite is. They, they understand the, more than ever, right? I mean, just people in general, worldwide, we understand and we're aware of high touch surfaces that we share with other people. We're aware of um, just the things that we do when we touch and interact with, we're, we're wearing masks, we're social distancing, all these things have just changed in a year. So when we first um, launched a product into market, this, the, our product was called NickGuard, and we did some extensive testing, um, primarily with Dr. Bowman to develop this product, but it was used primarily to protect, protect infrastructure in different industries throughout the U.S. So we're talking about U.S. and worldwide, actually. So when you talk about the oil and gas industry, and we're looking at um, pipelines, you can see this top picture here is actually a pipeline that's been attacked by bacteria. You don't think about that, right? You don't think about bacteria causing corrosion. When you hear corrosion, you think rust, or you think of some kind of chemical interaction or oxidation. But more than 40% of the, the corrosion that we experience in the U.S. is caused from bacteria. Now, when you think about oil and gas, you think about a pipeline, it's in contact with the air, with water, with soil, with all different environments where bacteria live. And so, Two different things can happen. One, there are actually bacteria that can eat through solid surfaces. Most of the time what's happening is that we're forming a biofilm inside of the pipe. Bacteria are attaching to the biofilm and then they're producing harmful gases that end up corroding the pipe. And then you get failure, structural failure. This happens too um, when you look at infrastructure, transportation industry, bridges, all different kinds of things that um, we rely on as a country are, are corroded or destroyed due to these harmful bacteria. So we developed this material, Mitgard, and the second picture shows you a pipeline that's actually protected by Mitgard. We've had pipe um, in the ground for, for a long time now. And so we have some really good results on how we're actually protecting against this. Um, so this is one way back then, I mean, even just a couple of years ago, how we were protecting against harmful microbes. Another uh, product that we have is called FalGuard, and here we're actually preventing hard shell fouling. When you, um, how many of you have heard of hard shell fouling? It's kind of a different concept for us up here in West Texas. We understand oil and gas, right? But, but thinking about things that are um, hard shell fouling. So when you think about offshore oil and gas, we can go back to oil and gas, but talk about offshore. So pipelines are gonna be coated underwater in some kind of polymer structure so that they aren't, they just don't get completely corroded by seawater. But what happens to the, the say plastic that they're, they're coating them in is that 
ocean life starts to attach to it. And eventually with that kind of weight, uh, you also have a structural failure. And so when you think about ships in the ocean, when you think about all different kinds of things, experience hard shell fouling. So this, this picture on the left is showing you um, a panel. All of this testing is done in Tuticorin Bay off the coast of India. It's supposed to be considered the highest fouling region in the world. So sometimes one day of fouling in Tuticorin Bay can be equivalent to a year of fouling mm -hmm. in other ocean waters throughout the world. So it's very high foul rate. But this shows you um, on the left-hand side, it, we, we have a, um, a sample that is not protected with foul guard. And on the right-hand side, we have a sample that's protected with foul guard. And so we, we know that we can develop these materials that are protecting against harmful microbes, um, both in and out of the water. So as engineers, logically, we're, we're being able to um, develop materials that are protecting different infrastructure on, in large commercial environments. We wanted to do something that was um, relevant for homes, for households. So when we had the hurricanes in Texas a couple of years ago, we were actually approached by an outside group that asked if we could develop something that would help remediate uh, the mold situation. So after a hurricane, decades even after a hurricane, mold is still the most prevalent issue that people deal with. They estimate that 47% of homes in the U.S. have some kind of mold problem, which again, in such a dry region where we live, we don't always think about mold in our homes, but it's there and it's true. So we have a, a product that we developed called Paint Guard. Paint Guard is, it's a small um, tube of liquid that you mix into a gallon of paint and it will prevent mold growth. Um, our test, uh, the longest testing that we've done is up to two years. So we know that we can permit, prevent mold go, growth for up to two years is what we can claim now. So um, this is EPA approved. We have gone through all kinds of testing with it and it's probably our easiest, most practical project to, product to use. Sells every day um, because people are, are becoming more and more aware of different organisms that are living in our homes right now. Okay, so what happens is we are an antimicrobials company and let me also say that the patents for our company are owned by the Texas A&M University system and by West Texas A&M University. So we develop patents and we have undergraduates, we have graduate students, and then we have full-time engineers that actually work in the lab and with the company to develop products and conduct research. So it's, it's been a, a really great model for us. And what happened is that in January, we started to see the results of things that were coming out of Wuhan. And we knew as engineers, um, just like when we had the hurricane and we knew that there would be fallout and there would be a need for some kind of antimicrobial, when we started to see this happening, we knew that at some level we were gonna have to be able to produce some kind of product that would protect against viruses. This is new for us. We had done most of our work in bacteria and in mold. However, we had started working on a prototype for a similar product to what we've launched during the pandemic. And so we had done some initial research on it and we had, um, we had prototypes in testing. We knew at that time things weren't shutting down yet. We hadn't seen what would actually happen over the next nine months. Uh, but as engineers, you're very aware of problems that are occurring. And it's almost impossible for us to not immediately start working on some kind of solution. So when we saw this happening, we knew that in order to move forward, we were going to be able to, we were going to need to be able to launch some products into the market during a really questionable time in the market. And Copper Clean is our product that has come out since then. So Copper Clean, it's a very um, straightforward product. It protects surfaces, high touch surfaces. So Dr. Bowman talked about how we can cough on our hands, we can touch the mouse, then I can rub my eye and we can easily spread it. So when we think about door handles, um, when we think about railings and we think about elevator buttons or grocery shopping carts, um, when you think about the Skylink at the airport, like all kinds of different things where you're sharing a surface with other people, 
we wanted to develop a product that could be easily implemented and actually protect people that we, I mean, we know. Like we're, we were wanting a solution for our next door neighbor, our friends who own a business. Um, we wanted to be able to find something that could help this, once we launched this, it was actually late March, early April. And so we were already looking for ways that we could keep certain areas of industry open, but then also ways for businesses to be able to communicate to their um, the, the pe their consumers, their employees, their customers that they care, that they're doing something to protect their businesses so that they could reopen at that time. So this is Copper Clean, an antimicrobial surface patch. So what happened is that we started testing with copper particles, nanoscale copper particles originally. We were incorporating them, we were using an alloy because the things that we know about copper are, I mean, it's been an antiviral since ancient times, antiviral, antibacterial, like antimicrobial. You think about water systems in your house that were made copper pipes. Has anyone ever seen copper pipes? Um, so copper has been a known um, antiviral for a long time, but when we are able to use nanotechnology, we can take some of the inherent, I won't call them weaknesses in copper, but the things about copper that make it hard for us to use. Copper is very soft. It's not very structurally sound. Uh, copper patinas or oxidizes very quickly. Statue of Liberty is what color? Green, <laughs> because, and it's actually made, made out of copper. So we know that this material exists that we can, um, we can optimize on a nanoscale by incorporating other materials with copper particles so that we can resist some of the corrosion and patina so that we could strengthen the product so that it could last longer and so that we could optimize it for what we call extreme environments. So even, even here in the, the Panhandle of Texas, we can swing 30 to 40 degrees temperature wise in one day. So when you, in, when you, launch a product into the market, you have to be able to answer questions like how will it withstand our water? How will it withstand cleaning products? All of these different things. So we were able to actually take copper and make it, we were functionalize it so that we could use it during this time. This part of it was fascinating. So in April, we're, we got the first research studies out that were looking at the SARS-CoV-2 virus looking at it specifically with regard to hard surface or um, solid surfaces. And every article that came out said copper is the only thing that's effective against it. Copper is the only thing mitigating. Um, on cardboard, on plastics, on stainless steel, it was living for days. And on copper, it was living for four hours. And four hours seems like a long time, but not when you look at the number of cop uh, um, virus particles that they were actually putting in the test. So uh, uh, from the very beginning, copper was the best choice against the coronavirus for solid surfaces. So this talks about our proprietary, al proprietary alloy. We have um, two different patents that are pending on these products, these copper clean products right now. Again, um, owned by the, the university and the system. We are EPA approved from the ground up. So the, from the, the mine where our copper is, is first um, originates all the way through to our lab where we're processing it for actual use, the, um, the whole process has received EPA approval. Interesting to note, our EPA approval is for bacteria because EPA right now is not issuing approvals for the specific uh, coronavirus right now, the SARS-CoV-2. So that's in the process that will happen over the next few years. Um, people have been working to get copper EPA approved for virus for viruses for a while now, and I think this this is probably the impetus for that. But at the moment, when I am marketing my products, I have to be extremely careful about what I say. Nothing that I put out that is written can say that this this material is effective against the coronavirus. We know it is because they've tested it in labs and it is, but your research, research results are different from what EPA allows you to claim. So from a marketing perspective, that's been very interesting for us because we have to really toe the line as far as what the EPA says that we can say about a product when we're advertising it. I won't go into this really in detail um, because again, you can see the, the copper I mean, you can see the uh, virus cell. It has the spikes that she talked about, which now I feel like I know all about, even though I didn't just a minute ago. 
but basically the copper at the surface is in effect, it's effectively dissolving some, it's leaching some, releasing ions. Once these ions get inside, then they produce a, a reactive oxygen species and they can um, prevent the cell from be, or the, prevent the virus from being able to uh, continue on and live in the cell. The, our products are very easy to apply and maintain. We wanted to have something that you could get in the mail, take out of the package, put on and have an immediate solution in place. So we have on our website, we have very specific videos on how to apply it, how to clean the surface and that kind of thing. And you guys can look at that because I'm time-wise gonna need to. Um, we have standard sizes that we have the universal surface patch. I'm not sure if any of you have seen these on campus, but they're, we have quite a few of them on campus. The universal surface patch is made just for a pull or push door. Um, it's bigger, larger than a hand, an average size of a hand. But um, the lever handle patch, this is our most commonly sold patch. We thought the universal surface patch would be, but this is apparent uh, what most people have. So these right now we're in all kinds of different industries. Larger surface patch, we had um, co some commercial uh, real estate companies that needed larger ones because they had really large door handles. And so now um, we're selling quite a few, few of these, but we're, we're in all kinds of different industries, education, healthcare, uh, movie theaters, restaurants, uh, some airports, I bet all kinds of industries that you can think of that would need to be able to show employees and customers we're doing something during this time to protect you and to stay open. And then we also do all kinds of customized. Um, we did some customized car handle latches for lift. We've done, uh, we do all kinds of phone patches all the time. Uh, we, we have push bar, like push plates for bathrooms. We have crash bars, all kinds. As engineers, we love a new idea and a new, new way to develop it. Okay, and we're saving that till, yep. All right, thank you for having me here. I could, I could talk about this all day. I, I loved it. We love the idea of developing solutions to problems, um, but I appreciate your time.